the 30th of August to the 20th of September 1975 saw the transmission of Terror of the Zygons, written by new writer Robert Banks Stewart and directed by veteran Who director Douglas Camfield, launching Doctor Who's 13th season. The, the viewing figures for part 1 were the story's highest at 8.4, but part 2 saw the lowest figures for the story and season overall with 6.1 million. Robert Holmes was fully settled into his role as script editor for the series and finished work on season 12, whose stories were initiated by outgoing producer Barry Letts. Holmes was keen to bring on new writers for the series and approached an old acquaintance of his named Robert Banks Stewart. Stewart had begun his writing career in the theatre before moving to television, with credits for The Avengers, Danger Man, The Saint and The Sweeney. He had also had been approached to write for Doctor Who during its early years, but nothing really came of it. Being a native of Scotland, Stuart was keen to set his story in his home country and suggested to Holmes that the legendary Loch Ness Monster would make an ideal basis for a story, given that there were very few details that existed about the mythical creature. The idea that a creature exists in the loch has been fantasised for as much as 1500 years. However, the story gained new popularity when, in 1933, a road passing by Loch Ness was constructed and interest in the myth reaching a global scale by the 1960s. The script was officially commissioned by Holmes to prepare a six-part story titled Loch Ness in March 1974. For the rest of the year, Stuart began working on his script, but was cut from six episodes to four, and unfamiliar with the style of Doctor Who, Stuart initially wrote the Doctor, Sarah and Harry similar to the protagonists of The Avengers, and had to be guided by Holmes in refining these elements. The original script placed more emphasis on the Scarrison and the Loch, and the initial cliffhanger for episode 2 involved the Doctor being attacked by the monster as he rode across Loch Ness. Holmes, however, felt that the Zygons were more interesting characters and asked for more emphasis on them, given that they could interact with the main cast a lot more easily. During rewrites, Sister White became Sister Lamont, and Claymore Oil was renamed Ibanean Oil. In early 1975, the story underwent title changes from The Loch Ness Monster to The Secret of Loch Ness. At the same time, Douglas Camfield returned to direct after a five-year absence. He had last helmed Inferno, but never completed due to suffering a heart murmur in production, but was luckily drawn back to the series due to his fascination with Stuart's story. Throughout 1974, Buzz had been building about Jerry and Sylvia Anderson's new science fiction series entitled Space 1999, which was being developed for ITV, with the series set for a September debut. Since 1970, Doctor Who had always debuted in early January, and concern now arose that if season 13 started three months after Space 1999 launched, the viewing figures could dip. In January 1975, it was decided that season 13 would be brought forward for an autumn start, meaning that the recording block had to start much earlier. To facilitate this, season 12 was trimmed from 26 episodes to 20. Secret of Loch Ness was scheduled to be the final serial of the 12th recording block, and the season 12 finale, but was held back to start season 13, but this also eliminated a break between seasons 12 and 13 for the production team. Meanwhile, producer Philip Hinchcliffe also determined that Harry Sullivan should be written out of Doctor Who at the end of Secrets of Loch Ness. The character had been created at a time when it was thought that the fourth Doctor might be played by an elderly actor, who would be unable to participate in action sequences. With the casting of Tom Baker in the lead role, Hinchcliffe felt that Harry was now redundant. Holmes disagreed with the producer, believing that Harry was a valuable and distinctive ingredient of the TARDIS team, but nonetheless had Stuart amend his scripts appropriately, and Hinchcliffe would later admit that Holmes' views had been correct. The exit of Harry Sullivan also removed one more link between the series and the Earthbound unit format, which had propelled it through the early 1970s. Hinchcliffe wanted to set more adventures on alien worlds, and actors Nicholas Courtney and John Levine, who had been contracted for Secrets of Loch Ness to once again play the Brigadier and Benton, became aware that their irregular appearances in Doctor Who would soon cease altogether. Meeting with Hinchcliffe in the BBC bar, Courtney suggested that the Brigadier should be killed off, exiting the series in a blaze of glory. Hinchcliffe turned down the idea, however, feeling that it would be inappropriate for a character who had been so vital to the programme. Location work began filming in West Sussex, as the budget didn't accommodate the cast and crew to travel to Scotland. The first day in March 17th, the beach scenes were recorded at Climping Beach in Climping, while the TARDIS arrival took place on Ambersham Common in South Ambersham. The Common also stood in for the sequences on Tullock Moor. The Zygon spaceship landing and the hospital exterior were Hall Aggregate's quarry in Storrington. The 19th of March was spent entirely on the Common, 
with more materials set on the moor and a departure of the TARDIS. On March 20th, the venue shifted to Charlton, with filming occurring at both the Fox Inn and a barn. The day after, Furnace Pond in Crabtree posed as Loch Ness. This should have marked the end of the recording in West Sussex, but poor weather earlier in the week forced the allocation of two extra days. March 24th saw a return to Hall Aggregates Quarry for another hospital exterior shot, while the 25th was again spent at Abersham Common, once more pressed into services as Tullock Moor. The same day, Elizabeth Sladen was contracted for 22 episodes of the 13th recording block. Tom Baker's services had already been secured for all 26 episodes on the 21st. On March 26, footage of Millbank Tower in London was captured for use in the climactic Scarrison sequence. By now, both stop-motion animation and puppetry had been employed to bring the Scarrison to life. Unfortunately, this material proved to be of inferior quality, and Campfield decided to use as little of it as possible. The first studio session then occurred in BBC Television Centre Studio 3. Monday, April 7th involved the taping of Episode 1, with the second episode following on Tuesday the 8th. Around this time, Hinchcliffe elected to change the serial's title, as he feared he feared that emphasising the Loch Ness Monster was misrepresenting the story's contents. The adventure became The Zygons, and finally to Terror of the Zygons. Recording shifted to a slightly later in the week for the second studio block, which took place in TC4. Part 3 was completed on Tuesday, April the 22nd, along with the lone Fargill Castle scene from Part 4. The remainder of the last instalment was then taped on Wednesday the 23rd, the completion of Terror of the Zygons brought Doctor Who's 12th production block to a close, although work immediately proceeded on to the next set of episodes for Block 13. This also meant that Ian Marta's time as a regular as a Doctor Who artiste had come to an end. Marta would continue to maintain a connection to Doctor Who, however, after returning for one more appearance as Harry shortly after in The Android Invasion. Marta went on to write several novelizations of Doctor Who stories for Target Books. He also also offered an un an original Harry Sullivan novel, Harry Sullivan's War, the target short-lived The Companions of Doctor Who range. He twice made unsuccessful bids to write for the TV series itself, once in 1980 and later with a submission entitled Strange Encounter for season 23, and with Tom Baker co-wrote the screenplay for an unmade Doctor Who feature film called Doctor Who Meets Scratchman. Marta also continued to act on stage and television, earning credits on programmes such as Bergerac and The Return of Sherlock Holmes. Unfortunately, Ian Marta died of a diabetic condition on October 30th, 1986. The Doctor, Sarah and Harry returned to Earth in response to the Breedier's summons. The units are investigating a series of attacks on the North Sea oil rigs and have set up a temporary HQ in the Scottish village of Tulloch. The attacks are the work of a huge cyborg, the Scarrison controlled by a group of aliens called Zygons, whose spaceship lies at the bottom of Loch Ness. The Zygons plan to take over the Earth as a substitute for their own planet, which has been devastated by solar flares. They are using their shape-shifting abilities to take on the identities of locals, whose inert bodies are held aboard their ship. The Doctor releases the Zygon prisoners and causes their ship, which has now emerged from the Loch, to self-destruct. Only their leader Broton survives, he has assumed the identity of the Duke of Orgill and travelled to London. There he plans to give a show of strength by destroying a world energy conference with the Scarrison. When it comes to discussing Terror of the Zygons amongst fans, it is consistently rated high, and I admit, I am no exception. The story itself is nothing too special or unique, but it's more or less Doctor Who at a crossroads, as at this point in its history, Unit was now on its way out, and Terror was more or less the organisation's final hurrah with the final appearance of the Brigadier for another eight years. There's a sense of looking to the series past for one last time, before heading off to pastures new. However, the simplicity of the story is what makes it so watchable for me. Tom Baker continues to shine in the debut of his second season, and season 12 had established a very different Doctor than his predecessor John Pertwee, and he continues to do so here. While the Doctor does lecture the Brigadier about oil not being an emergency, it feels very similar to how the third Doctor would comment on the futility of minerals. The way the lines are delivered, though, are remarkably different. The third Doctor would usually stand tall and claim his presence with his arguments. In comparison, Tom is lying down in Scottish attire, and his body language suggests that he doesn't take this emergency seriously at all. It says to the viewer that because the Doctor has a childish attitude towards oil, then the viewer should as well. As we learn later in the season, the Doctor walks in eternity, so it can be argued that the oil humanity craves is irrelevant to him when there is so much more out there. The fourth Doctor seems to have mellowed out more since his first season. 
and for the next two seasons he will adopt this darker, more brooding persona, but of a childlike sense of adventure that the character inhibited during the Philip Hinchcliffe era. Rather than be sympathetic towards Sarah when they're both running out of oxygen in part two, he simply tells her to shut up and save her breath, but of course he hypnotises her into not breathing and thinking that she doesn't need it. The Doctor has a plan and you should let him get on with it, but he also shows his heroic and selfless side when he endures pain in order to send a signal to unit within the Zygon spaceship. This is the definitive fourth Doctor for me. Elizabeth Sladen a lot of inquisitiveness to Sarah Jane. It does get her into danger with the Zygons, but she is able to learn from her mistakes, such as encountering the fake Harry in Episode 2, and not trusting the real one when she meets him again in Episode 3. As a journalist, she's able to use intelligence and curiosity to move the story along naturally, without it feeling forced or contrived. It's ironic that this is Harry's departure, when I feel that this is the best material that Ian Marta had during his time on the series. But I also feel it's a culmination of his character growth. The bumbling Doctor from season 12 has now vanished, and he's a consistently reliable and professional. His, his skills seem to be more useful when he's on Earth. His departure scene is a bit lacklustre and not entirely emotional, but I feel it is in line with Harry's character. He gets on with any challenge in front of him, but prefers his skills to be honed in on Earth. However, Ian really shines as the Zygon double, and can be pretty intimidating when he's trying to kill Sarah in the barn. It's such a huge departure from his character, and shows the range that Ian could play as an actor. The Brigadier is also given a, f a fitting hurrah, as the comedic character from Planet of the Spiders and Robot is now gone, and replaced with a more stern authority figure that he was in his early years. This could have been due to Canfield's direction, as he had previously directed The Invasion, which was Unit's debut in 1968. I do think the Fourth Doctor and the Brigadier work very well together, and it is a shame that they couldn't share any more screen time. Their relationship is different to that of the Third Doctor. Here they feel more like equals, where the Third Doctor was the Brigadier's superior. But however, the Fourth Doctor is clearly annoyed when being summoned by the Brigadier, as he feels he doesn't really owe Unit much anymore. Courtney, Courtney plays the Brigadier with a stiff upper lip, and one of my favourite scenes is when he's on the phone to the Prime Minister. It it's for you, sir. The Prime Minister. <laughs> A leopard steward speaking. Oh, absolutely understood, madam. No public announcement. It's just golden. Not to mention the kilt is absolutely brilliant. The supporting cast are all memorable in their roles. John Woodnut plays the Duke of Forgill, his copy, and the Zygon leader Broton. Woodnut performs all three roles superbly. He has a coldness that he brings to the Duke's copy and you could make the argument it's a parody of the pompous authority figures that the Third Doctor would typically encounter on Earth. The copy is cold and distant, but the real Duke is very warm and friendly. His standout performance has to be Broton though, giving the character the typical arrogance of a Doctor Who villain, but providing that strong, husky voice that would guarantee nightmares and scurrying behind the sofa. I am Broton, warlord of the Psychons! Despite the huge mask, John's eyes pierce through, and the close-ups are extremely effective. Angus Lenny plays Angus, the landlord of the Fox Inn. Angus had previously appeared as Storr in the Ice Warriors, and sadly meets a similar fate when he is killed by one of the Zygons. <laughs> Angus is your stereotypical Scot, but I think he represents the heart of the village, as technology doesn't mean much to him, and thinks it's better if people simply sit and talk to one another. He is a man of tradition. My favourite moment is when he assures Sergeant Benton that there are no bugs in his inn. Angus also feels that the oil rigs have taken all the servants from his inn, which was reflective of the time of fishermen's jobs being affected by oil rigs. In the northeast of Scotland, they'd give up their jobs as fishermen and have to work on oil rigs to make ends meet. Lilius Walker plays Sister Lamont, who gives a chilling but not entirely subtle performance. It wasn't really a surprise to me when she turned out to be a Zygon copy, given how cold and distant she was with the other characters. Compare this to the Duke when viewers at the time may have been used to dismissive authority figures. Nevertheless, the scene where she kills a soldier with a rock is genuinely chilling, and who knows, this could have made children be very wary of nurses. The Zygons were designed by talented costume designer James Ackerson, who had previously designed the Fourth Doctor's costume and would go on to win three Oscars in the 80s and 90s for film. The design for the Zygons is very distinctive and memorable, despite only appearing in one story during the classic era, 
I still feel that they are very iconic to this day. While their plan isn't anything too special, they want to make the Earth their home and wipe out humanity. I think it's the look and feel that makes them rise above being generic bad guys. The voices are very chilling to listen to and sound pretty terrifying towards the end, when Broton attacks the Doctor. I think a lot of what their iconography is down to is the way Camfield films them. We first see their hands operating controls, then we get a close up of their eyes, and for the cliffhanger we finally see them in full when they surprise and attack Sarah. It's the perfect way to build tension, and once they're on screen, they don't disappoint at all. It would be another 38 years before they'd reappear on our screens in the 50th anniversary, and then reappear in the Series 9 two-parter, The Zygon Invasion and Inversion. In my opinion, it was worth the wait, and none of their reappearances diminished them as characters, but even if they did, they'd still be one of Doctor Who's greatest one-off monsters. Being directed by Douglas Canfield, the production is of course to a high standard. The location filming is shot beautifully, particularly the sniper scenes on the beach. We get a beautiful establishing shot of the calm sea. Then we see Munro's body washed on the shore, confirming the Doctor's theory that the sea is calm, but never empty. Close up on the sniper's trigger are also very chilling, and the fact that Harry gets shot as well really racks up the tension and paces the mystery along superbly. The characters are in danger at just the right moment so it doesn't feel rushed or action with no purpose. I do find it a shame that Bergen never worked on any more stories beyond Sea to Doom, but at this point Dudley Simpson was the in-house composer and many directors were content to use him. This isn't to dismiss Dudley's work at all, but I think it would have been nice to hear more different musical com composers during the 1970s. If you're interested in listening to Jeffrey's score, you can find a few tracks on Spotify or listen to it isolated on the DVD. If I did have criticism of Terror of the Zygons, it would most obviously be the Scarrison. The stop motion just doesn't really hold up anymore in the scenes we do see it. If there's ever a Blu-ray release of Season 13, I'm sure there will be an optional CGI update. Luckily, the full view of the Scarrison isn't used a lot, and a lot of the time we see it from the creature's POV, and don't see it attacking the rigs, but we are fully aware of its power due to its powerful bite marks in the structure, and it still remains a credible threat for our heroes. That's not to say that the rest of the production is a complete letdown. The interior of the Zygon spaceship, designed by Neil Curzon, is very good. It's distinctly alien, but looks uniquely organic. The lighting also really adds to the atmosphere. The green and orange makes you feel like you're deep underwater, though the Zygon controls do remind me of pizzas a little. This was to be Neil Curzon's only story where he worked as a set designer, and the model work by John Horton is also really good. The Zygon ship looks intimidating, as if it was built for conquest, and the effect of it rising from the lock may look slightly off by today's standards, but I don't think it's anything too distracting, and the explosion at the end is big enough for me. <laughs> Despite the Scarrison appearance and its simplicity, Terror of the Zygon still holds up over 40 years later. It's a callback to the Pertwee years of alien invasions, but perfectly looks ahead to the future of Doctor Who under Philip Hinchcliffe, with more emphasis on horror, darker tones, and fallen gods, and a new companionship with the fourth Doctor and Sarah Jane only. Units are very well handled, the music is superb, it's shot like a film, and the monsters are scary and memorable. The Brigadier and Harry are given good send-offs to their characters that feel true, and Tom Baker now feels fully settled. Terror of the Zygons has always ranked highly when it comes to fan and audience polls, and will continue to do so for many The 27th of September to the 18th of October 1975 saw the transmission of Planet of Evil, the second story of season 13, written by Louis Marx and directed by David Maloney. Part 1 gained the highest viewership of the story with 10.4 million viewers, and Part 3 with the lowest figures of 9.1 million but it was clear that the audience was now on the rise for the rest of the season. Whilst developing ideas for season 13, producer Philip Hinchcliffe and script editor Robert Holmes agreed that Doctor Who had spent too much time on Earth in its recent years. To this end, they entered into discussions with designer Roger Murray Leach about creating a truly alien environment within the confines of the Ealing Television Film Studios. For the story, which would make use of the proposed sets, Hinchcliffe suggested taking inspirations from the 1956 sci-fi classic film Forbidden Planet, which he enjoyed as a child. One of the changes Hinchcliffe suggested was that the monster could represent the dark side of a planet as opposed to the dark side of a scientist's mind. 
Holmes was also interested in an adventure which drew upon Robert Louis Stevenson's seminal 1886 novel, The Strange Case of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. Robert Holmes approached writer Louis Marx, who had twice contributed to Doctor Who over the course of the previous decade, recently scripting Day of the Daleks three years earlier. It was decided that Marx's scripts would be set in a jungle environment, in contrast to the barren world of Forbidden Planet. Louis Marx, who was under contract to the BBC as a script editor, received staff clearance from, for his scripts on May 19, 1975. In reality, he had been working on them since much earlier in the year. Serial 4H came to be called Planet of Evil, although the slightly lengthier title of The Planet of Evil was also employed on occasion. While scheduled for production after Pyramids of Mars, it was planned to transmit Planet of Evil second in the season to maintain a better balance between stories set on Earth and in space, and between those recorded on location and in studio over the course of season 13. Shortly before production began, Philip Hinchcliffe requested an amendment to the closing moments of the serial. In the original script, Sorensen did not reappear after plunging into the black hole. Hinchcliffe felt that this was not a suitable fate for a well-intentioned character, and so asked Holmes to adjust the ending to have Sorensen survive at the end. Assigned to direct Planet of Evil was David Maloney, who had recently completed work on Genesis of the Daleks. Having been an important part of the initial discussions about the story, Murray Leach was brought aboard the crew as well. With no location filming allocated to the production, Murray Leach was given the freedom to design a detailed, exotic and alien jungle set at Ealing for filming on June the 11th and 12th. This set proved so successful that it was extensively photographed by the BBC Educational Service, which would use it as an example of design excellence for years afterwards. Nonetheless, the jungle set did cause some problems, in particular making it virtually impossible to position sound booms. This forced most of the dialogue to be dubbed in post-production. Work at Ealing continued on June the 13th, filming scenes in the void. Model shots were also completed there on the 14th, and as usual, studio recording for Planet of Evil took place in fortnightly blocks on Mondays and Tuesdays. The first of these, in BBC Television Studio 6, encompassed June the 30th and July the 1st, for material from episodes 1 and 2, respectively. The second session occurred on July 14th and 15th, this time in TC3. In addition to recording scenes from episode 3 on the 14th, the TARDIS sequences for part 1 were also taped. The second day was devoted entirely to the serial's fourth episode. The TARDIS picks up a distress call and the Doctor and Sarah Jane arrive on the planet Zeta Minor. There they discover that a Marestran geological expedition has fallen prey to an unseen killer, and only the leader, Professor Sorensen, remains alive. A military mission from Marestra has also arrived to investigate. The culprit is revealed to be a creature from a universe of antimatter, retaliating for the removal by Sorensen of some antimatter samples from around the pit that, are, that act as an interface between the two universes. The Marestrans take off in their ship, but it is slowly dragged back towards the planet due to the antimatter on board. Sorensen himself becomes infected by the antimatter and, and gradually transforms into the Antiman, a monster capable of draining the life from others. The Marestran commander, the increasingly unhinged Salomar, attacks Sorensen with a radiation source, but this only causes him to multiply, and soon the ship is overrun by deadly creatures. When it comes to discussing Planet of Evil, it is usually overlooked in Season 13 and the Philip Hinchcliffe era as a whole. This could be down to the fact that it is sandwiched between Terror of the Zygons and Pyramids of Mars, stories that are more highly regarded amongst the fan base. But I think unlike The Android Invasion, this doesn't feel like a story from another era. It feels like Philip Hinchcliffe is now truly making his mark on the series, with more focus on the sci-fi and horror elements. With the Doctor and Sarah now travelling alone, Tom Baker takes a fully commanding presence as the Doctor. With Adventures on Earth no longer tying him down, the stakes are raised even higher for the character, as now the fate of the universe will be on his shoulders, but with a sharp wit that makes the Fourth Doctor one of the most iconic incarnations. The quip about Shakespeare being a terrible actor is brilliant. I met him once, you know. Who? Shakespeare. Charming fellow. Dreadful actor. Perhaps that's why he took up writing. But there is no doubt that the fourth Doctor can't be a dashing action star like his predecessor, as he punches Salomar, fights off Sorensen's antimatter monsters, but eventually saves him from the wrath of the Zeta Minor planet. The fourth Doctor's character is at perfect balance here, fighting for the best solution but keeping his wits about him. I also love his enthusiasm at the start as the t standbys for emergency materialisation, but criticises the folly of the crew for tampering with the forces of nature. The Doctor is a reassuring presence for viewers, 
There may be danger, but the Doctor will solve it. However, it doesn't undermine the threat on screen. The acting and the character of the Doctor are just in perfect balance here. But instead of wearing it like a badge, Tom plays these emotions with a more subtle root of a glimpse from time to time. The Fourth Doctor is compassionate, but seeing implacable as this is a nice reminder that his concern isn't just for the human expedition, but for life and order in the universe as we know it. The Doctor's line, I am not without influence, reminds the viewer that he is far more than just a random space adventurer, and wants to make the universe a better place. Elizabeth Sladen has admitted that this was her favourite story during her time on the series, as she much preferred working in the studio, and felt that she was at her most comfortable with Tom Baker. Sarah is now completely on her own with the Doctor again, but she feels completely equal to the fourth Doctor. In comparison with her relationship to the third Doctor, I saw that as more of a father-daughter relationship. Here though, the fourth Doctor and Sarah feel like best friends. Sarah also feels very independent as well, making her own way back to the TARDIS on a hostile alien planet, which is the last known planet in the universe. It's interesting how the previous story was so close to home for the viewers, but now, along with Sarah, the viewers are taken further than they've ever gone before. But Sarah takes it in her stride and doesn't feel scared or overwhelmed by it. She's a constant reassuring presence to the viewer that everything is okay, and her scenes of believing the Doctor is dead is well acted by Sladen. Though I'm sure this won't pop up again in later stories. The supporting cast are more or less made up of a repertory company from director David Maloney. German actor Frederick Jaeger plays Professor Sorensen and had previously appeared as Jano in The Savages in 1966, and will go on to play the creator of K-9, Professor Marius, in 1977's The Invisible Enemy. Sorensen is a man who has a thirst for knowledge, and what he doesn't understand, but he only begins to fear it when the antimatter begins to consume him. The slow progression into insanity is perfectly portrayed by Jaeger on screen. Like the Doctor, he has the best of intentions when it comes to gathering knowledge, but too much interference causes him to lose, lose his humanity piece by piece. He's a good man deep down, but some of the worst situations have started with the best of intentions. Prentice Hancock plays Controller Salomar. Prentice plays him with a commanding presence, but as a man who won't listen to reason, and feels he is constantly undermined by both Sorensen and Vyshinsky. Though the way he looks in this serial reminds me a lot of actor Malcolm McDowell. Ewan Solon plays Salomar's underling Vyshinsky, and I enjoy the conflicting relationship between him and Salomar. By appearance and knowledge, you'd expect him to be in command, but is the one to be taking orders instead. You can tell there is a power struggle going on, and when he shouts at Salomar to give the order, it shows how the command structure is falling apart the longer they remain on Zeta Minor. The shouty commander that won't listen is a cliche that was prominently used in the Patrick Troughton era, but here it's interesting to see a younger actor play the part as opposed to an older gentleman. Graham Weston plays De Haan. Graham had previously appeared in Patrick Troughton's final story, The War Games, as a resistance leader, Russell. David Maloney suggested to Graham to add a little more humour to DeHaan's character, in order to make him seem less like a red shirt. His complaints about moving the antimatter turns him from a faceless muscle to a living, breathing person whose death does mean something in the story. Michael Wisher plays Morelli in his final Doctor Who appearance. Michael was best known for playing Dalek creator Davros in Genesis of the Daleks, and was asked to reprise the role again in 1979 and 1984, but had to decline due to other commitments. While I don't think Planet of Evil is his best performance, the variety of roles he played in Doctor Who can't be ignored, and sadly Michael Wisher died of a heart attack in 1995. Tony McEwen plays Baldwin, one of the first victims of Zeta Minor. His death scene for me is pretty effective, given that he is acting to nothing. David Maloney suggested to him that he play it as if he's been crushed to death, and for me it works, as the horror comes down to what we don't see. The production values are consistently high throughout this serial. Praise must of course go to the impeccable set design by Roger Murray Leach, who was a prominent designer during the Hinchcliffe era. The sets are utterly beautiful and look brilliant. You really feel like you've stepped into another world. It feels so alien after years of Doctor Who being predominantly earthbound. Shooting some of the sequences on film look fantastic. It's almost like a movie. I do find it a shame that not all of the Zeta Minor sequences couldn't be shot on film, as it really ups the horror aspect. The cinematography adds such a cold and horror atmosphere to the story, but that's not to say that the cinematography in BBC Television Studio is bad. The direction by David Maloney allows the colours of the jungle to pop on the screen, and with slow panning movements we get to see the planet in full. 
Luckily, it never feels dull or unappealing, and is always a highlight for me whenever I revisit the story. The sets for the spaceship interior I do find a little bland and uninspired. It's like all the budget went on to the jungle sets. However, it's nothing too distracting or disappointing for me, as the conviction of the cast pulls it off. The antimatter monster effect is surprisingly effective. It appears at just the right moments and is built up perfectly. Maloney keeps it hidden and invisible at the start of the story, and when we finally see it, it doesn't disappoint. The effect looks so seamless when it interacts with the rest of the cast, and their reactions are really well done. While it may look garish by today's standards, it has to be remembered that this effect was all done without computers, which makes it all the more impressive for me. The strobe lighting effects make up for the lack of laser effects on the gun, and really bring more style to the picture. The makeup effects for the corpses are equally as terrifying. The skeletons look so chilling and really ups the tension of what the antimatter creatures can do, and why the minerals must be returned. After being absent for the previous two serials, Dudley Simpson returns as the in-house composer, and provides with a creepy score that helps build the atmosphere. One of my favourite tracks is when this, the Doctor discovers the antimatter in part 4. The music is appropriately light and whimsical to add to the Doctor's curiosity, but becomes louder and more sharp when the possessed Sorensen confronts the Doctor. Sadly, Dudley's music is not available as an isolated score on the DVD, However, you can find the soundtrack on the YouTube channel Odd Planet Craft 2180, who has isolated the music from the main soundtrack. A link is in the description below, and, and go have a listen if you're interested. Having not seen Planet of Evil in years, I was surprised by how well it held up over time. While I don't think it's a classic story in the same vein as, say, Genesis of the Daleks or Pyramids of Mars, I still think it's a solid fourth Doctor story that should definitely not be overlooked. It definitely feels like a serial where all aspects of the production complement one another to bring us a solid four-part adventure. When it comes to comparing Louis Marx's other work for the series, I think this will stand as his best for me. There is threat and terror around every corner, and the characters are constantly in danger, but the pacing is well handled so the horror is built up accordingly. Tom Baker and Elizabeth Slater are at the top of their game in terms of character and performance. They totally sell the danger that surrounds everyone and everything. If I do have criticism, it's that members of the crew are bland characterization wise but that's not to say that they are all bad. I really enjoy the characters of Sorensen, Salomar and Vysinski, though, though Prentice Hancock has come under criticism in certain reviews for being unlikable and wooden. Me, me personally, I feel he gave a good performance, and his ruthlessness as a commander just makes the story feel all the more unsafe for our protagonists, and I don't think that there is a weak link within the cast. I do think keeping Sorensen alive at the end was a good idea. He's not an outright villain, so him being returned to our universe feels justified, as he only succumbed to the demons of Zeta Minor rather than of his own accord. But it's a good message of not interfering in what we don't understand. Everybody deserves a chance to start again. Despite its mixed supporting cast and, un and uninspiring interiors, I find Planet of Evil to be a solid mix of sci-fi and horror, with a superb looking exterior for Zeta Minor. While I don't think it's the strongest story this season, I encourage a lot of fans to give it another chance. If you haven't seen it in a long time, or didn't do much to impress you first time, then I hope this review has encouraged you to check it out, or maybe change your mind. Whilst not the best fourth Doctor story, Planet of Evil is best enjoyed on an autumn evening, with the lights off, and behind the sofa. It's a great mix of sci-fi and horror, which Doctor Who does. The 25th of October to the 15th of November 1975 saw the transmission of the third serial of season 13, Pyramids of Mars, written by Stephen Harris, really a pseudonym for script editor Robert Holmes from an idea by Lewis Griefer and directed by Paddy Russell. The viewing figures increased for the series, with part 4 gaining the highest figures of 11.7 million, and part 3 gaining the lowest of the serial with 9.4 million. Amongst the new writers considered by incoming Doctor Who script editor Robert Holmes was Lewis Griefer. In addition to story editing for ATV, Griefer had created the series Who Done It, and had also written for programmes such as The Prisoner and Ghost Squad under the pseudonym Joshua Adam. Aware that Griefer had an interest in Egyptian mythology, Holmes suggested that he consider an adventure which would combine science fiction with the trappings of mummy horror films such as Universal's 1932 movie The Mummy and the 1959 Hammer horror film's production of the same name. With these ideas in mind, Griefer submitted a storyline in July 1974 entitled Pyramids of Mars. In it, the Doctor and his companion Sarah Jane 
attend a conference on food reserves at the British Museum, along with Unit's Brigadier Lethbridge Stewart. It was suggested in early drafts that the character might be killed off during this adventure. The Doctor's friend, Professor Fawzi, and his partner, Dr. Robertson, are there to unveil their work on a new type of grain which can flourish on the surface of the moon, thereby solving world hunger problems. However, the conference is soon attacked by the crocodile-like Egyptian god Sebek and his army of mummies. Sebek and his master Seth are aliens who came to Earth millennia ago, intent on conquest, but were placed in suspended animation by a powerful artifact called the Eye, wielded by Horus, another of their kind. Having reawakened, they now intend to replace Fawzi and Robertson's grain with one which will result in the moon's disintegration, which in turn will have catastrophic effects on planet Earth. The Doctor manages to locate Seth's resting place beneath an Egyptian pyramid, and is assisted by Horus and another deity, Isis, in defeating Seth and destroying the probe in mid-flight. Despite grave misgivings with regard to Griefer's understanding of Doctor Who's format, Holmes met with the author on July 4th. He suggested that the would-be gods could actually be from Mars, having fled the planet after it was devastated by galactic conflict. Holmes disliked the idea of the special grain, and instead recommended that the Earth Project be one to begin the transformation of Mars's surface into a habitable environment. Seth would attempt to hijack the mission, his goal being to fire a rocket at the Great Pyramid of Mars, where his jailers still sleep in suspended animation. Holmes also encouraged Griefer to establish scientific explanations for some of the supernatural phenomena he described. Producer Barry Letts, who was in process of handing over to his successor Philip Hinchcliffe, thought that the Egyptian gods might actually originate from different planets outside our solar system, explaining why their physical forms vary greatly. Holmes formally commissioned Griefer to write a storyline for Pyramids of Mars on July the 8th. At this point, he was considering the possibility of making a search for the Eye of Horus, which would disappear at the story's climax. Holmes continued to have reservations about Pyramids of Mars, even after Griefer submitted his revised outline, but still contracted the writer to script the four episodes on July 23rd. Griefer's story now involved a fortune hunter named Hennessy, who, at Fawzi's behest, is pursuing ancient wild rice hidden in the Egyptian sarcophagus, which is also the target of Shebek, as Sebek had been renamed by now. Griefer delivered the script for episode 1 on October 7th, this prompted Holmes to advise the writer that he was straying too far away from the mummy horror movie premise. Matters deteriorated from here. First, Griefer was taken badly ill, delaying the completion of the final three episodes. There, Holmes discovered that these were unsuitable for broadcast and failing to tie up key plot points and lacking a suitable emphasis on the Doctor's role. In late November, Griefer left England for Tel Aviv University in Israel, where he had previously committed to a teaching position. Finally, on March the 7th, 1975, Holmes informed Grief as agent that his client's script would be abandoned. With production looming, Holmes was forced to rewrite the adventure from scratch. He was assisted by Paddy Russell, who had been assigned to direct the story. Russell's last Doctor Who work had been on Invasion of the Dinosaurs two years before. Abandoning most of Grief's concepts, such as the modern day setting, Unit, and Shebek, Holmes instead situated the action into 1911. Seth became the focal villain with Holmes, referring to the character as Set and then Sutek both alternative names for the, for the deity in Egyptian mythology. Holmes also took the opportunity to include a scene in the second episode, which depicted how the events of 1911 could change Sarah Jane's presence. He felt that this would help offset the general presumption by viewers that threats encountered in a historical setting didn't matter, since modern day Earth had been seen to endure in other Doctor Who serials. Hinchcliffe, meanwhile, suggested the inclusion of the logic puzzle in the final episode, Drawing on Franz Kafka's 1926 novel, The Castle, the character of Ernie Clements was intended to survive the story in Holmes' original version, but Paddy Russell elected to kill him off instead. The frustrating series of events that led to Holmes penning a completely new version for Pyramids of Mars prompted Hinchcliffe to secure from Graham MacDonald, the head of serials, a special dispensation for Holmes to write up two Doctor Who adventures per season. This was very unusual, with which the BBC viewed script editors writing for their own series. Pyramids of Mars was scheduled to be the first story of Doctor Who's 13th recording block, and given the production code Serial 4G. Initially, it was also envisioned as the first adventure to air as part of Season 13, but these plans changed when the BBC decided to bring forward the broadcast of the new season to autumn 1975, rather than early 1976. With Terror of the Zygons now being held over from the 12th production block to begin Season 13, consideration was given to pushing Pyramids of Mars as far back as the 4th serial. Ultimately, it was decided to swap it in the running order with Planet of Evil, the next story to be made, 
to avoid beginning the season with two Earthbound serials. Location filming for Pyramids of Mars took place on the grounds of Stargrove Manor in East End, Hampshire. At the time, the property was owned by Mick Jagger, the lead singer of the Rolling Stones. Work at Stargrove began on April 29th and continued until May 2nd. This was followed by three days of model filming from May 7th to 9th at the BBC Television Centre Puppet Theatre. For the 13th production block, Doctor Who was chiefly taped in two-day studio blocks on fortnightly Mondays and Tuesdays. For Pyramids of Mars, the first of these sessions occurred in BBC Television Centre Studio 3 on May 29th and 20th. These days focused on completing the majority of episodes 1 and 2, although Russell opted to take part 4's TARDIS scene on the 20th to avoid erecting the set again. Two more days of model filming then took place on the 22nd and the 23rd. Recording concluded with the second studio block on June 2nd and 3rd, this time in TC6. Episode 3 was taped on the first day, alongside the initial four scenes of the final instalment. Material in Sutex Prison and the Organ Room for Part 2, and the opening Egyptian sequence for Part 1. The rest of Episode 4 was then recorded on the 3rd. By this time, Lewis Griefer had requested the removal of his name from a serial which bore almost no resemblance to what he had written. Instead, Pyramids of Mars bore an on-screen credit to the pseudonym Stephen Harris. The TARDIS materialises on Earth in the year 1911, inside an old priory owned by Egyptologist Professor Marcus Scarman. Scarman has been possessed by Sutek, last survivor of the godlike Osirens, who is held prisoner inside a pyramid in Egypt by a signal transmitted from, on, from one on Mars. Sutek desires his freedom and instructs Scarman to construct servicer robots, which look like Egyptian mummies, to build a missile with which to destroy the Martian pyramid. The Doctor falls this plan by blowing up the missile, but then falls under Sutek's control himself, and is made to transport Scarman to Mars in the TARDIS to destroy the Eye of Horus. Pyramids of Mars is consistently ranked in fan polls, and often cited as one of the best Fourth Doctor stories, often competing with Genesis of the Daleks in the towns of Wayne Chiang in the top 10. If you've seen my top 5 Fourth Doctor stories video, you know I hold this story in very high regard, and I see it as one of Doctor Who's all-time greats. With a seven-year stint as the Doctor, it is hard to say which story has Tom Baker's best performance. Personally, I'm always torn between this story and Horror of Bang Rock as his finest hour, as I feel both stories showcase the Fourth Doctor's character at his very best. The very first scene with him establishes his character so perfectly. He barely looks at Sarah, reminding her and the viewers that the Earth is not his home, his age of 750, and that he walks in eternity with his time machine. I love how he doesn't make eye contact with Sarah at all. It's as if all of these years of travelling are on the Doctor's face. We're reminded of how powerful and alien the Doctor is. This is also a perfect first scene for anyone who wants to start with the series. It tells you everything you need to know about the Doctor, without coming across as clunky exposition. Despite his claims for walking in eternity, the Doctor has very little patience for matters that, I, that are incidental to him, such as his lack of reactions for the death of the characters around him. These deaths are merely the start of it all if Sutek is released. While Sarah chastises the Doctor for not being human, she stands by him as he is making a stand against an evil god, and with, and with the stakes as high as this, there's no time for mourning the few when billions of lives are at stake. The Doctor is portrayed as a powerful being in this story, but when pitted against Sutek, he crumbles before his might due to Sutek's even more powerful will. The Doctor calling him a twisted abhorrence is brilliantly delivered by Tom. Sutek is the ultimate evil, everything the Doctor stands against, and it makes the words spoken by him all the more scarier. The Doctor would make a great friend, but an even worse enemy for you. He's even possessed by Sutek in Part 4, that shows the character's vulnerable side. He may be an alien with a powerful time machine, but pitted against Sutek, and the Doctor is merely like a mouse looking up against an elephant. Elizabeth Sladen continues to shine, looking incredibly beautiful in the Victorian gown. She represents the warmth and humanity in this bleakly cold story. Sarah in this story is incredibly resourceful, calling off the mummies and using the rifle to blow up the missile. She criticises the Doctor's lack of humanity for the death around them all, but that's the point. She knows how high the stakes are, and any time mourning a death is precious time being wasted that could be used stopping Sutek. She sees how omnipotent Sutek is when the Doctor takes her to the present, if they don't stop Sutek in 1911. Sarah Jane is the audience. It tells them that anything affected in the past will affect the world they know, and why Sutek must be stopped. There is still warmth between the Doctor and Sarah, such as the quips between the two, so it's still a reminder of the love and friendship these two have for one another. 
Pyramids of Mars is blessed with an amazing supporting cast, all giving absorbing performances. Bernard Archard plays Professor Marcus Scarman, an Egyptologist who is possessed by Sutek and becomes his servant. Bernard had previously appeared as Bregan in The Power of the Daleks and gives a chilling performance. His expressions are so dead yet terrifying at the same time. He rarely raises his voice, but his robotic, calm demeanour makes him all the more scary to watch. The only time he gets angry is because he's reminded of the love that he had for his brother Lawrence, but it makes him all the more dangerous because Sutek doesn't want him to feel anything and be nothing but his puppet. Michael Shirt plays Lawrence Scarman, Marcus's younger brother. Michael had previously appeared in The Ark and The Mind of Evil, and would later go on to appear in The Invisible Enemy, Castro Valva, and Remembrance of the Daleks, and Star Wars fans will recognise him as the ill-fated Admiral Ozzel from The Empire Strikes Back. Lawrence's conflict comes from the love for his brother and wanting to help the Doctor. He realises that Sutek is evil, and the Doctor is right when he sees the inside of the TARDIS, but is a tragic character because he won't let go of the fact that Marcus is dead, and shows where his loyalties lie when he won't let the Doctor kill Marcus. The Doctor gives him another chance to help, and, like Sarah, he does provide a warmth to the story, but is ultimately killed by Marcus. It's impossible not to like him, which makes his death scene all the more powerful, and equally makes the tension between the Doctor and Sarah increase. Gabriel Wolfe plays Sutek, the last of the Asirans, and the inspiration for the Egyptian god Set. Gabriel would later lend his vocal talents to the Beast in The Impossible Planet and the Satan Pit. Sutek easily has the best voice for any Doctor Who villain. It's simply mesmerising and terrifying. The Mask is also fantastic as well. Despite having no expression, he's as equally as terrifying. As a villain, he has no redeeming qualities and wishes all life to perish in the universe, simply for his own amusement. He's everything the Doctor stands against. George Tovey plays Poacher Clements. While he doesn't interact with the main characters or the story much, he represents the innocence that will be hurt if Sutek isn't stopped. The scenes of him being chased by the mummies in the woods is brilliant. It shows no matter how fast he'll run, the mummies are relentless in their task. They will hunt you down until you are too tired to run. Peter Mayock plays Namin, a servant of Marcus Scarman who has been obsessed with serving Sutek, but is killed by Marcus in a memorable cliffhanger and death. His death shows how everything in the universe is an enemy of Sutek, even if you are for him. Peter Copley plays Dr. Warlock, a close associate of Marcus Scarman that survives being shot by Namin, but is killed by one of the mummies when he is discovered by Marcus. This story t this story is a rarity amongst Doctor Who, as it is one of the few stories where every single supporting character ends up dead by the conclusion. Paddy Russell once again returns to direct, and brings a very distinctive style to the serial. The location work looks utterly fantastic. The manor feels enormous from the outside, but the horror aspect is ranked up with the woodland locations. If these woods are entered, you won't be coming out, as evident by the Clements chase scenes in part 2. The mummy costumes look brilliant. The lack of expression is what makes them scary as well as well as their brute strength. They fully represent Sutek's power and ideologies. Anything insignificant is to be destroyed with no remorse or pity. If shot inefficiently, the mummies could have easily have looked unintentionally cute and cuddly, a bit like the Yeti, but luckily they are memorable monsters that serve their purpose. The visuals are also brought to life through Russell's excellent direction, such as the slow camera pan across the woods as Namin pursues the Doctor and a bleeding warlock, or Sarah using the rifle to blow the missile to smithereens, and even the green light from Sutek's eyes that causes the Doctor great pain. As a director, Russell isn't afraid to give the cast exposure and shows confidence in what they are capable of. The 1911 sets designed by Christine Rusco are fantastic. They really add to the atmosphere and truly feel like you're in a Hammer Horror film. If I had any criticisms directed towards the production, it would be the set design on Mars in part 4. While not terrible, the overuse of colour separation overlay just feels like they ran out of money to build more sets, and while it does give it a distinctively alien feel, it is a letdown compared to how brilliant and atmospheric the 1911 set looks. Dudley Simpson returns once again to provide an excellent score for the story, and is on top form here. The score for me really stands out during the mummy chase sequences in the first two episodes. There's very little dialogue, but the scene is brought to life by Dudley's magnificent music. I particularly like the shaker used when the Doctor, Sarah and Warlock are trying to escape the mummies. While we don't see them, the music reminds us that they are still out there, and could kill us at any moment. Other memorable scores include when Scarman kills Namin. The score becomes louder when Namin screams and feels the pain, but becomes slower and more muted when the screaming dies down. 
A great score for me is defined by what the music matches by what's occurring on screen, and this story is no exception. If you were to listen to it isolated, you'd know which piece of music matches to which scene. Dudley's music is unavailable as an isolated score on the DVD. However, in 1993, a collection of music recomposed by Heathcliff Blair were included in a CD along with The Ark in Space, Genesis of the Daleks, and Planet of Evil. The CD is no longer in print, but if you wish to buy a copy, you can find it on Amazon for a reasonable price. However, many copies are on eBay for a bigger price, only buy it if you want to put down the cash. Or you can find the music online, isolated by YouTube channel OddPlanetCraft2180. Pyramids of Mars still holds up years later as one of the very best fourth Doctor stories, and one of the all-time classics from Doctor Who's long history, and I find very little to fault with it. However, part 4 does come under criticism for not being as strong as the preceding three episodes, and while I agree that the story does lose a bit of its horror aspect, I think it deflates the story in any way. The threat and tension of the story is still present, and doesn't detract in any way. Mars is one huge death trap, and the Doctor and Sarah could end up dead if they are not careful. The sci-fi does take over the horror, but it doesn't feel out of nowhere, as Sutek is already established as an alien or siren that influenced the Egyptian gods. It's what Doctor Who does best, taking a legend from ancient Earth and giving it a sci-fi twist. Although it is rather stupid that Horus left Sutek in prison with all his willpower, it's like giving a prisoner the key to his own cell. Marcus and Lawrence are also established as brothers, and that they grew up together, and roughly being the same age, but Marcus looks at least 20 years older than Lawrence, he looks more like his dad than his brother. However, I can overlook this as the performances are all memorable, and the bond between the two brothers feels strong. All of these points I'm making are just nitpicks, the, ser the serial still holds up unbelievably well. Watching it again for this review, it just gets better and better for me every time I watch it, a rarity for any Doctor Who serial. Tom Baker and Elizabeth Sladen are at the height of their powers, and I think this is their best serial together as a Doctor Companion pairing. They are on top form and work so well together. As actors, they have so much range that their characters are put through, and this is what makes them so brilliant to watch in this story. The range they go through feels so natural to them. Sutek is a memorable villain and a perfect antagonist for the Doctor to face up against, and I applaud the new series for using Gabriel Wolf's vocal talents. Despite my few nitpicks, Pyramids of Mars has everything that makes Doctor Who rolled into a four-part story, and will forever be remembered as Doctor Who at its very best that stands the 22nd of November to the 13th of December 1975 saw the transmission of the Android Invasion, written by Terry Nation and directed by Barry Letts. The viewing figures reached the highest of season 13, with part 3 gaining 12.1 million and part 2 gaining the lowest of the story with 11.3 million. Although Terry Nation had written and co-written 10 Doctor Who stories since 1963, only the Keys of Marinus from season 1 omitted his most famous creations, the Daleks. Nation had an informal agreement with the Doctor Who production team at the time to provide one Dalek serial per season, the most recent of these being Genesis of the Daleks. When it came time to discuss Nation's contribution to season 13, however, he was made aware that producer Philip Hinchcliffe and script editor Robert Holmes were far less interested in spotlighting old monsters than their predecessors had been. Instead, Nation began work on two non-Dalek storylines, the first entitled The Enemy Within, and was commissioned on November 29, 1974, while the other, called Return to Sue Cannon, was requested on February 13, 1975. The second idea appears to have been abandoned, but on February 27, Nation was contracted to provide full scripts for The Enemy Within, now under the title of The Kraals. Originally, a key plot element was the Kral androids were going to be mirror images of the people they were imitating, and this was how the Doctor deduced that Sarah Jane was actually a robot in Episode 2. It was eventually decided that this would be too technically demanding to realise, and the action was suitably amended. Nation envisaged the Kraals as somewhat insectoid in appearance, although this idea was not used in the final design work. Around the start of July, the adventure's title reverted back to the enemy within, and was classified as Serial 4J. At about the same time, it was learned that Nicholas Courtney would not be able to reprise his role as Brigadier Lethbridge Stewart in the story because of obligations to a theatrical tour. With the start of production looming, Holmes replaced Lethbridge Stewart with a new character called Colonel Faraday to be played by Patrick Newell. Originally, Faraday was conceived as a Brigadier, but was later demoted to Colonel in later drafts. On July 14th, the series title was finalised as The Android Invasion. 
A familiar face was assigned to direct Serial 4J, Inchcliffe's predecessor as producer Barry Letts. Barry Letts had been lined up to oversee a biography of Marie Curie, but when this became entangled in internal BBC politics, Letts was given work as a script doctor on various drama programmes. On January 21st, he had been commissioned to write a storyline for Doctor Who entitled The Prisoner of Time, but nothing really came of this. Finally, he secured permission to serve out the remainder of his BBC contract in a directorial capacity, and took the reins of The Android Invasion. Letts' previous directing credit on Doctor Who had been for the final third Doctor story, Planet of the Spiders, at the end of season 11. Letts began work on The Android Invasion with five days of location in Oxfordshire. July 21st was spent at the National Radiological Protection Board in Harwell, whose grounds served as those of the defence station. The next two days were devoted to scenes in the woods around the false Devisham. The principal location was Tubney Wood in Tubney, although a small amount of work on the 22nd took place at Wash Washam Quarry in Whitney. It was at Tubney Wood that Tom Baker performed a sequence in which he was submerged in a river. Unfortunately, Baker swallowed too much water and had to be taken to a hospital to have his stomach pumped. Finally, material set in Devisham itself was filmed in the village of East Hagborn on July 24th and 25th. Rejoining Doctor Who for the studio recordings were Ian Martyr and John Levine. Ian Martyr had just completed his regular engagement as Harry Sullivan in Doctor Who at the end of the 12th production block, and was making his only return to the programme. For Levine, the android invasion marked the last of a long series of regular appearances as Benton, dating back to 1968. Levine left the acting profession in 1977 and took up a number of different jobs, cruise line entertainer, head of an audiovisual company, and even a private detective. More recently, Levine moved to the United States and began acting again, including a role in the horror film Cannibalistic. Neither Marta nor Levine found the android invasion to be a pleasant experience, as the new production team's de-emphasis of the unit format had become progressively apparent. Levine also missed Nicholas Courtney's presence on set. The first studio session for the android invasion took place on Monday, August 11th and Tuesday the 12th in BBC Television Centre Studio 3. These days were chiefly concerned with taping the majority of episodes 1 and 2 respectively, although part 3 scenes in the Kraal cell and corridor were recorded on the 11th, and sequences in the disorientation chamber and corridor from the same instalment were completed on the 12th. The second block was scheduled for exactly two weeks later, on August 25th and 26th. This time the venue was TC8. Again, Let's primarily concentrated on one episode each day, but also performed some shooting for other instalments. Part 2 scenes in Stigron's control room and the corridor of the Defence Centre were taped on the 25th. On the 26th, material in the scanner room from Part 1 and in the loading bay from Part 3 was also recorded. Unfortunately, Let's ran out of time on this day, resulting in the loss of a key scene from late in the final episode, which would have explained how the Doctor re reactivated his android duplicates, as well as accounting for the Kral invasion armada. The TARDIS arrives on the planet Osiden, where the alien Kraals have created an exact replica of the English village of Devisham and its nearby space defence station, and populated it with androids in order to rehearse for an invasion attempt. A human astronaut, Guy Crayford, has been duped into collaborating with them. The TARDIS travels on to Earth alone, and the Doctor and Sarah following Crayford's rocket, which is being used to carry the spearhead of the invasion force. The Kraals' chief scientist, Stigron, intends to release a deadly virus in order to weaken resistance to the forthcoming invasion. The android invasion is considered to be the weak link in Season 13 due to its callback to the Pertwee era, as opposed to more emphasis on gothic horror. However, I don't think it makes the story necessarily terrible, but when compared to other stories of its time, it is considerably more lacking. It more or less feels like a story just there to feel four weeks of airtime, and feels pretty standard and generic. Tom Baker gives a more subdued performance as the Doctor, now this may have been down to illness after Tom swallowing a lot of pond water. That's not to say Tom isn't trying as the Doctor, as he certainly gives a good performance. Where he really stands out is the android version of himself. Being able to switch from the android pretending to be the Doctor and then switching back to the android is pretty chilling, especially when he fires the gun. Elizabeth Sladen gives a good performance as Sarah Jane, and for once it's nice to see the companion be aware of the location rather than the Doctor. Her story on Guy Crayford allows the viewers to be aware that she did have a life before meeting the Doctor. Her performance as the android Sarah is beautifully subtle as well, though it's rather stupid that the android version gives the Doctor a lot of information about the Kral plan. Either Stigron is very proud of his plan that he likes his androids to monologue routinely, or he's a bit of a numpty. 
The cliffhanger to part 2 is very effective as the android face falls off and reveals the inner workings. It's a very disturbing image and shows how inhuman the androids are. Ian Marta and John Levine return briefly as Harry Sullivan and Sergeant Benton respectively. Sadly, neither of them exit the series in a blaze of glory, and their presence doesn't exactly feel unique to their characters. They could have been any generic unit personnel, and I feel nothing would have changed. Ian Marta discussed his disappointment with the serial in a 1984 interview. I didn't care for my last story, The Android Invasion, one little bit. There was no real reason for Harry to be in it at all. I couldn't see the point of it. My own unfulfilled wish was that Harry could have been blown up while trying to save Sarah Jane or something on those lines. A genuinely heroic exit instead of what I actually got. Their final lines are also really naff. Yes, and twin. When I look across Unit's time on the series, I find it odd how they were introduced in the invasion with such a dynamic introduction. Yet as we went through the years, the family just dropped slowly but surely, most of them not even getting an exit, just making an indefinite final appearance. Milton Johns plays astronaut Guy Crayford. Milton had previously appeared as Benick in The Enemy of the World, and would go on to play Castellan Kellner in The Invasion of Time, though I'll always remember him as Mr. Rossiter from The Basil Brush Show. Come on, open up! I know you're in there! I've found the landlord! No, no, I am the landlord! Despite his good performance, his character and backstory is pretty inconsistent. The crowds brainwash him into thinking that the humans have left him for dead, and they had to rebuild him, but leaving his eyes still damaged. However, it's revealed at the end that his eye is perfectly fine, simply by taking off his eye patch. He's an astronaut who's been missing for two years, and he never took the patch off. What, he never took it off while he had a bath or a shower? The motivation is just really forced and contrived, so it's hard to sympathise with Crayford as a tragic figure. Martin Friend plays the Kral leader Stigron. I quite like the design of the Kral creatures themselves, even though their overall plan is pretty generic. They want to release a virus upon the Earth. Again, replace this with radiation slash plague from previous Dalek stories, and it just feels very been there, done that. Even the idea of doppelgangers feels repeat from Terror of the Zygons. However, the performance is pretty good, despite the makeup and standard motivation. Roy Skelton plays Stigron's underling Chidaki. Roy is best known in Doctor Who for voicing the Daleks and Cybermen in select stories, as well as the voice of Zippy and George on the children's TV series Rainbow. Patrick Newell plays Colonel Faraday, the leader of the Space Development Complex while the Brigadier is in Geneva. His appearance is almost a blessing in disguise. If it was the Brigadier, I felt Nicholas Courtney would also have been wasted by the script. The supporting cast do their best with the material they have, and I don't think anyone gives a bad performance. The actors themselves just aren't given that much to work with. The production work is pretty good. It's nice that they use Barry Letts' talents as a director, and it might be his best looking story for me. The location filming is probably my favourite aspect of this serial. The opening images of an android throwing himself off a cliff is really effective. I do find it a shame, however, that they slowed down the picture. It would have been stronger and probably more horrific if they let it flow at its natural pace. However, it is a family show, and, they, and that probably would have been too far for the series. I'm a personal sucker for village locations, so the filming work done in East Hagborn is really good. The summer location work doesn't detract from the atmosphere, but in my opinion adds to it, and makes the location work really stand out, and it's a nice contrast from the grey and monotonous sets of the Kral spacecraft. It's an interesting idea of how bright and alive the human world is, compared to how monotonous the androids are, how all the individuality has been sapped in the fake village, despite being an exact replica. I think Barry's directing on the serial would have been more highly regarded had there been a better script, but there is solid direction here. Dudley Simpson once again provides a pretty good score that's mystery to the atmospheric scenes and excitement in the action. My favourite score has to be when the Doctor and his android double fight it out in the control room. I like how bombastic the score becomes, similar to the fourth Doctor's eccentric personality. Now the score is doubling down on both of them. The music for parts 3 and 4 can be found on the 50th anniversary CD, which you can buy for a reasonable price online, but be aware that it doesn't come with the full score for the entire serial. If I had to summarise the android invasion, it would be solid. The production values are solid, as are the plot monsters and the acting. Sadly, the execution of its story is just really messy. Such as when Stigron is killed, the story just seems to come to an end. What happened to the rest of the Kral invasion fleet? There's no mention of them giving up or being defeated. It's as if the writers just forgot about it. 
The androids are said to be indestructible, yet their faces fall off when they are tripped up. Crayford not realising his perfectly functioning eye, etc. It's interesting how series 6 of the new series took images for its main story arc. Can't see the similarities? Here's what I mean. I suppose it's nice that even mediocre Doctor Who gets recognition. Despite my grievances with the android invasion, I don't think it's a bad story, it's just very uninspiring when compared to other stories of the season. While Terror of the Zygons also had elements of the previous era, it felt fresh like it had those horror and gothic elements to keep it fresh within this new era, whereas this story feels like a Pertwee era story that happens to star Tom Baker. The android invasion is meat and potatoes who, it's not going to blow you away with any sort of epicness, but with good performances and solid production values, it's likely to keep you entertained for a solid hour and a half. It's average Doctor Who. Nothing more, nothing The 3rd of January to the 24th of January 1976 saw the transmission of the brain of Morbius. After a brief break over Christmas, season 13 resumed broadcast for 10 more weeks. Part 4 saw the highest viewing figures of the story with 10.2 million, and part two with the lowest figures of 9.3 million. One of Doctor Who producer Philip Inchcliffe's interests when it came to science fiction was robotics. Intrigued by the works of Isaac Asimov, Inchcliffe wanted to do a story which explored the relationship between man and machine, a different angle than had been attempted in the season 12 debut Robot. That adventure's author, former series script editor Terence Dix, had gone on to write a Doctor Who stage play called The Seven Keys to Doomsday for the Christmas 1974 season, starring Trevor Martin in the title role, and had subsequently penned a rejected storyline for the programme entitled The Haunting. Dix was now called upon by script editor Robert Holmes to conceive a serial based upon Hinchcliffe's suggestions. In addition to the robotics angle, Holmes and Dix sought to incorporate elements of Mary Shelley's 1818 novel, Frankenstein. The story of a scientist who brings to life a man assembled from corpses, it had found great popularity when it became a part of Universal Pictures' horror canon as Frankenstein in 1931. Hammer Studios had also made a series of movies starring the monster, beginning with 1957's The Curse of Frankenstein. The use of Frankenstein as the foundation for a Doctor Who serial was in keeping with Holmes' tendency to base adventures on classic works of gothic horror. Indeed, The Haunting had been an attempt at a vampire story. Dix was commissioned to write the storyline for The Brain of Morbius on May the 1st, 1975. The intention was that it would become Serial 4K, the penultimate adventure of Doctor Who's 13th season. As such, Dix was asked to formulate it in such a way that no filming, location, model or otherwise would be needed, thereby saving money for the final adventure of the season. The Brain of Morbius would therefore be the first completely studio-bound Doctor Who serial. Dix envisaged a story in which a space criminal called Morbius, likely named after the character in the 1956 feature film Forbidden Planet, crash lands onto a planet and his robot servant, who lacks any sense of aesthetics, assembles a new body for him from other aliens, in ignorance of their vastly different physicalities. Dix drew partly upon the costumes for the Chloranchillas, creatures which had appeared in the Seven Keys to Doomsday for the crab-like elements of Morbius's new body. He also decided to set the action upon the planet which had been the home of a decayed civilization in the stage play, and took inspiration from H. Ryder Haggard's 1886 serial novel, She, in developing the Sisterhood of Khan and their Flame of Life. Dix was commissioned to turn the brain of Morbius into full script on June the 6th, and completed his work just before leaving the country for holiday. Unfortunately, around this time, Hinchcliffe and Holmes concluded that Morbius's robot servant would be too expensive to realise. The production team were also concerned that Dix had veered too far away from the horror elements they desired. By the time Dix returned from his holiday, time was growing short, and so the writer agreed to let Holmes restructure the scripts. Holmes therefore replaced the robot with a mad scientist named Solon and his servant Kondo, a homage to the Universal Frankenstein's Igor character and his many imitators. The script for episode 1 included an unusual piece of incidental continuity, featuring a mutt from the mutants called Kriz in its opening sequence. The final instalment also featured a controversial sequence in which the faces of previous incarnations of the Doctor are displayed, including some which were envisaged as preceding the original televised Doctor, William Hartnell. 
This was in contradiction to the three Doctors, which had established Hartnell's version as the first Doctor. Unfortunately, upon receiving the revised scripts for The Brain of Morbius on September 15th, Dix was very unhappy with the degree of rewriting Holmes had performed. In the ensuing days, he grew to understand why the production team had made such substantial changes, but Dix continued to feel that the removal of the robot character had done great damage to the central ideas of the story. Hinchcliffe, Holmes and Terence finally met to discuss the situation, and it was suggested that the brain of Morbius might instead be credited to Holmes, or to the Stephen Harris pseudonym used earlier that season for Pyramids of Mars. Finally, on September 22nd, Dix wrote Holmes to ask that the script editor devise some bland pseudonym for use on the brain of Morbius, and obesant Holmes therefore credited the serial to Robin Bland, much to Dix's amusement. The director assigned to the brain of Morbius was Christopher Barry, whose last Doctor Who work had been on Tom Baker's debut, Robot. Inspired by the Frankenstein trappings of the serial, Barry considered casting silver screen horror icons such as Vincent Price and Hammer Horror staple Peter Cushing in the role of Solon. The role ultimately went to Philip Maddock. Production on The Brain of Morbius began with a two-day session at BBC Television Centre Studio One. Monday, October 6 concerned the majority of Episode 1, as well as material on Khan's rocky surface for the remaining three instalments. Tuesday, the 7th, saw the rest of the episode recorded, picking up from Sarah spilling her wine, in addition to the initial laboratory scene and the majority of parts. A fortnight later, the second recording block took place in TC3 on October 20th and 21st. The first day dealt principally with episode 3, although it encompassed part 2 sequences in the crypt and on the staircase, as well as the chandelier smashing for part 1, and the wounded condo in the gallery for part 4. Apart from all the remaining episode 4 material, the 21st of October also involved the completion of the last few scenes of the preceding instalment, as well as the sacrificial bonfire for part 2. This day also included the recording of the mental duel between the Doctor and Morbius. Hinchcliffe had originally planned to have well-known actors photographed as the Doctor's earlier incarnations, but was unable to find suitable candidates. Instead, members of the crew of The Brain of Morbius and The Seeds of Doom, the next serial in production, were dressed in period garb and pressed into service. These included Philip Hinchcliffe, Robert Holmes, Christopher Barry, The Seeds of Doom director Douglas Canfield, production manager George Galacchio, Robert Banks Stewart, the writer of The Seeds of Doom, and production assistants Chris Baker and Graham Harper. The images of both Patrick Troughton and John Pertwee came from The Three Doctors, while William Hartnell was represented by a photograph from the Space Museum. Taping of Serial 4K then wrapped up with a remount of two scenes from Part 4, likely those in which Morbius attacks Solon and he recovers. This additional recording took place on October 24th in an unknown studio at BBC Television Centre. The Brain of Morbius was broadcast during January 1976. With its transmission, it brought it with a new round of criticism from the National Viewers and Listeners Association President, Mary Whitehouse, who was becoming increasingly vocal in her opposition to Hinchcliffe and Holmes' more horrific slant on Doctor Who. It would not be the last time that Whitehouse and the Doctor Who production team would come into conflict. The planet Khan is home both to a mystic sisterhood whose sacred flame produces an elixir of life, and to Mahendri Solon, a fanatical scientist who is using the remnants of spaceship crash victims to put together a new body for the still-living brain of the executed Time Lord criminal, Morbius. When the Doctor and Sarah arrive on the planet, Solon decides that the Doctor's head is just what he needs to complete his work. The Sisterhood, meanwhile, fear that the Doctor has been sent by the Time Lords to steal the last drops of elixir produced by the Dying Flame. They kidnap him and plan to burn him at the stake, but he is rescued by Sarah, who is temporarily blinded in the process. The Doctor is tricked by Solon into believing that his companion's condition is permanent. He asks the Sisterhood for help and restores their sacred flame to its former glory, using a firework to clear its blocked chimney. Returning to Solon Citadel, the Doctor and Sarah become trapped in the cellar. The Doctor releases cyanide fumes into the ventilation system and Solon is killed, but not before he has an used an artificial brain case to complete Morbius' new body. The Brain of Morbius is season 13 at its gothic high point, and is a story that I consistently rate high amongst my rankings, but with other fourth Doctor stories. If Pyramids of Mars was a homage to mummy movies of the Hammer Horror era, then Morbius is obviously a homage of Frankenstein. Right from the start, the story already sets its tone. It opens with a giant slave decapitating an alien creature. It more or less says that we are in for a gruesome ride. We have headless bodies, burnings at the stake, bleeding stomach wounds, brains splattering on the floor and strangulation. 
We're coming towards the end of the fourth Doctor's second series, and Tom Baker continues to be absolutely at the top of his game. Right from the opening, we see the Doctor is pissed off at the TARDIS being hijacked to Khan by the Time Lord. It's interesting to see how much of an annoyance they are to him after being free from his exile. The Doctor now wants to just travel on his own terms. His scathing opinion of the Time Lords is fantastic. No longer godlike beings that the Doctor is terrified of like in the war games, but more political animals that use the Doctor to do their dirty work. Heck, they don't even tell him what he has to do. We have a more serious and brooding Doctor, who is put through many hardships over the course of the serial. The Doctor is drugged by Solon, kidnapped by the Sisterhood, nearly burnt at the stake, knocked out by Morbius, and worst of all, gets caught in a storm. Did you spare a glass of water? The scenes with the Sisterhood are also great. It's another case of science versus religion. However, that's not to say that the Fourth Doctor doesn't show off his comedic chops as well. Hello, Sarah. Nice to be seen again. Oh. Superb, Ed. Huh. Well, I'm glad you like it. I have had several. His criticism of the Sisterhood singing, despite nearly being burnt at the stake. I'll Take no notice, Solomon. I'm delighted to see you. That music was terrible. Enough. And then there's this. Five minutes, Solomon. You spent your whole life resurrecting evil. Now either you disconnect the brain, or I'll do it my way. On paper, that sounds like it would be a funny scene, and Tom does sell it. But with a more brooding Doctor here, you can tell he is deadly serious. This Doctor isn't messing around. He'll give Solon one chance, or they do it his way. By force. The Doctor uses cyanide to kill both Morbius and Solon, and it strikes me as odd that a lot of fans seem to forget the extremity of his actions here, yet give the Sixth Doctor a hard time when he uses cyanide in the Two Doctors. Tom Baker is on top form here, he grabs the script by the throat and never lets go. It's easily one of his more versatile performances as the Doctor, and it's bloody brilliant. Like the Doctor, Sarah Jane is also put through a lot of hardships in this story. However, she's not a complete damsel in distress, and is very resourceful. For example, in episode 1, she tips away Solon's drink as she suspects poison, but still feigns unconsciousness when it happens to the Doctor, and doesn't even break the illusion when Solon orders Kondo to kill her. Another small moment I do like is when she follows Solon and Kondo in episode 2, and they nearly hear her, and she quickly takes out the rock from under her shoe so they don't spot her. Though her biggest moment, of course, is when she turns blind by the Sisterhood, and Elizabeth Sladen absolutely knocks it out of the park. Her eyes are always open, but her acting completely convinces you that she is blind, and she has to rely on hearing and touch to get around. I like how in episode 3, while she can't see Morbius's brain, she overhears Solon talking to him and say his name, and decides to lock him in the laboratory, as it will inevitably delay his plans. I love Sarah's initial reaction to being blind. She's devastated, but also tries to make light of the situation by thinking she could be a flower seller. It's funny, but also tragic at the same time, without the two tones clashing with one another. While it's a shame that she's knocked down a flight of stairs and rendered unconscious for real this time during the first half of part 4, it's definitely made up for when she and the Doctor are trapped in the laboratory. These scenes are just pure magic, and they have such great chemistry together. First of all, I was blinded. Then I was attacked by a great claw thing. Looked like it was made from butcher's leftovers. And then I was knocked, knocked down, down a flight of stairs. I, I should have stayed with him. Sonic screwdriver! It's in a TARDIS. Oh, yeah, or plastic. I don't know. Anyway, you can actually see that brain inside it, like a goldfish bowl. Did you read his thoughts? No. Sarah feels like a real person who is struggling with an, in with an insane situation. The audience is completely in her shoes here, and the fact that she comes through it all in this story relatively intact is more or less a miracle. The supporting cast are relatively small, but still leave a substantial impact on the story. Philip Maddock plays Surgeon Mahendri Solon. Philip had previously appeared as Broccoli in Dalek's Invasion Earth 2150 AD, Eliek in The Crotons, and the Warlord in The War Games. He's no stranger to playing villains in Doctor Who, and yeah, he's equally as great here. In fact, this might be his best performance out of all of his appearances on Doctor Who. There's two sides to Solon's character. On the one hand, you have the charming Surgeon, who may be a little eccentric, but gladly offers food and drink to the Doctor, so as not to arouse suspicion. But on the other hand, you've got the dedicated mad scientist who has been driven insane by years of isolation and his inability to let go from his work. Similar to the Doctor, Solon won't give up until he has done what he thinks is right. Solon made his entire work from nothing and built up his experiments and palace from ruin, 
yet this is what ends up killing him. He finishes creating Morbius' new body for him, but he dies anyway. While I think his death scene is a little lacklustre, it is very bittersweet. He dedicated his whole life trying to prolong Morbius' life, but as soon as he accomplishes that, he's killed for it. Sometimes in Doctor Who you get villains that eventually see the error of their ways and reform, but Solon doesn't, because this is all he has in life. Like the actual Doctor Frankenstein, he's mocked and ridiculed by people around him, but he remains dedicated to his work, sacrificing everything for it, but is punished for playing God and abusing mortality. Colin Fay plays Kondo, Solon's ego-like assistant. On the surface, he looks like a mindless brute whose only purpose is to obey Solon and kill when he needs to. Their relationship is fantastic, which is brought to life with the excellent dialogue. I like how Kondo grows throughout the story. Solon offers Kondo to the Sisterhood as a sacrifice in a half-baked attempt to get the Doctor back, but this still has consequences for Solon, as Kondo threatens to kill him. He becomes more disobedient of Solon as the story goes on, but reaches his boiling point in part 3 when he discovers that Solon has used his arm as part of Morbius. His rage is fantastic. The way Solon shoots at him repeatedly is like the behaviour of an animal, becoming more of a mindless brute than Kondo. The way he looks at his bleeding wound is really upsetting. I really do like his feelings for Sarah Jane, and finding her pretty. While the dialogue here may not be specifically special, I think it's the delivery by Colin Fay that really sells it here. Like girl. Oh, he's such a romantic. Well, you think you're a bundle of laughs, don't you? Uh, pretty? <laughs> All right, that'll do. She doesn't like it. Now get out. I like how he gathers his strength when he hears Sarah is in danger and tries to fight Morbius, but he fails. It's a very pessimistic ending for Kondo, but, but at least he died trying to do the right thing. Michael Spice voices the titular brain of Morbius. Michael would later go on to play Magnus Greel in the talents of Wang Chiang, and like Sutek in Pyramids of Mars, we have an equally as awesome voice for a villain here. For me, this achieves the impossible, making a brain in a jar an interesting character. Once again, the script and performances really help here. Every line from Spice, while Morbius is in the jar, is delivered with rage and impatience. Trapped like this, like a sponge beneath the sea, yet even a sponge has more life than I. Can you understand a thousandth of my agony? It is hard to express emotions through the voice when you have no facial expressions to work with, but Spice absolutely nails the delivery. While the script establishes that Morbius can't feel or see, we feel Morbius' pain through his delivery, and it's just superb. I like how Morbius even develops as a character. When he's put into the suit in part 4, the anger and frustration is replaced with arrogance and an immortality complex. When it is learned that I, Morbius, have returned from the grave, my followers will rise in their millions. Morbius now feels he has truly beaten death, and even one-ups the Doctor in the mind-bending contest. But ultimately, his arrogance is his downfall, as he is killed when the Sisterhood push him over the cliff to his death. Cynthia Grenville plays Marin, the High Priestess of the Sisterhood of Khan. Initially, Marin starts off as a superstitious woman who, who distrusts anyone or any spaceship that passes Khan. But with the Doctor's arrival, she stops relying on blind faith and learns to be more trusting of other people, and gives the last of her elixir to save the Doctor. Gilly Brown plays Ahika, Marin's deputy of the Sisterhood, who eventually succeeds to Marin as High Priestess. What I like is that she initially tries to be like Marin at the start of the story, but is the first to trust the Doctor more when he suggests looking at the elixir to discover its problem. She's being groomed for leadership and acts with confidence rather than being insecure, and by the conclusion she is the new leader. What I love about the characters is that every scene with them doesn't feel like a waste of time. They all develop at just the right pace to get where they need to be by the story's end and it feels very natural rather than forced and contrived. Christopher Barry returns once again to direct Doctor Who, and in doing so produces an incredible looking story. Despite being entirely studio bound, the story doesn't lose its atmosphere. I have to give praise for not revealing Morbius' brain right at the start. We hear a gravelly robotic voice speaking with Solon in part two, and when Sarah stumbles into the laboratory, the camera pans back revealing the illuminated brain silhouetted in darkness, which makes for a memorable cliffhanger. The lighting is also top-notch. The fact that the story mostly takes place at night really sells the horror aspect, and I almost forget that this is an entirely studio-bound story thanks to the effect of dry eyes and designer Barry Newbury's excellent sets. I love the interior of Solon's castle. It looks unfriendly and isolated, but in a really good way. 
The Mobius monster itself looks really good. In bright lighting, it could have looked like a huge teddy bear, but it comes across as terrifying and an ingenious design that serves its purpose well and shows how strong Morbius has become. The music by Dudley Simpson is also really good. My favourite track comes from when Kondo discovers his arm in part 3. The music becomes louder as Kondo becomes angrier, but hits lower notes when Kondo is shot, and a similar type of score happens again when Solon sees Morbius's brain hit the floor. The score becomes more bombastic as Solon is angry, then we hear strings as Kondo falls, wounded with grief, to the floor. The score also brings the mind-bending scene in part 4 to life. Without it, the scene would lack a lot of tension, but it's brought to life by a superb soundtrack. Dudley Simpson is on top form here. If you want to listen to the soundtrack by itself, you can find it on an album with The Ark in Space, Genesis of the Daleks, Planet of Evil, and Pyramids of Mars. Now be warned, it is out of print and only available from second-hand dealers. Alternatively, you can find an 8 minute compilation video from Odd Planet Craft 2180 if you want to hear the isolated score. The Brain of Morbius is a fantastic story that I love to the moon and back. I can't really find much fault with it, but I find it a shame it never seems to break the top 20 when it comes to best Doctor Who stories. I can see some of the violence and gore putting people off, but for me it doesn't feel in too bad taste, but rather raises the stakes and shows the horror of what the Doctor has to deal with. The plot is excellent, the dialogue sparkles throughout, and the cast members are all on top form. The Brain of Morbius is a story that will both repulse and entertain you at the same time. It's the ultimate expression of the Holmes Hinchcliffe gothic horror approach. It takes the horror elements and combines them confidently with science fiction. The music and sets are completely faultless, the atmosphere builds with great pace in the first half before we are treated to a splattering of blood and gore in the second half, and never feels rushed or too slow. I have watched The Brain of Morbius countless times, and I will never get bored by it. It's easily one of the fourth Doctor's finest. The Seeds of Doom was first broadcast from the 31st of January to the 6th of March 1976, bringing Doctor Who's 13th season to a close. Part 5 gained the lowest viewing figures of 9.9 .9 million, but Part 6 gained the highest figures of 11.5 million. The story originally intended to conclude Doctor Who's 13th season was The Hand of Fear, at that stage, a six-part story from the writing team of Bob Baker and Dave Martin. Baker and Martin submitted their idea to script editor Robert Holmes on May 29, 1975, and were commissioned to write Serial 4L on June 20th. A week later, director Douglas Camfield was contracted to work on the story. Camfield had recently completed the season premiere Terror of the Zygons. As development continued on the scripts for The Hand of Fear, however, producer Philip Hinchcliffe became increasingly worried that there were too many problems with the serial to be resolved before it entered production. Holmes had been preoccupied with rewrites on the brain of Morbius, but by late September had come to share Hinchcliffe's misgivings. Feeling that there was no way that The Hand of Fear could be broadcast as a six-part story, Hinchcliffe and Holmes requested permission from Head of Drama Bill Slater to pair two instalments off season 13 so that Baker and Martin's story could be redefined into a four-episode serial. This was refused, so instead Holmes turned to his friend Robert Banks Stewart to provide a backup six-part adventure in case The Hand of Fear proved unsalvageable. Stewart, who had previously written Terror of the Zygons, was commissioned on September 30th for a serial entitled The Seeds of Doom. The Seeds of Doom drew heavily on the Quatermass experiment, Nigel Neal's landmark 1953 television serial about an astronaut who transformed into a plant creature due to an alien infection. For the last time in the 1970s, The Seeds of Doom also incorporated the involvement of UNIT, the United Nations Intelligence Task Force. The organisation had been a Doctor Who fixture since 1968's The Invasion, and had played a key role during John Pertwee's tenure as the Doctor, but had been slowly phased out since Hinchcliffe and Holmes took the reins of the programme. The task force's loss of prominence was particularly apparent in the omission of any of the regular unit characters. Instead, the roles normally filled by Brigadier Lethbridge Stewart and Sergeant Benton were given to two new characters, Major Beresford and Sergeant Henderson. Stewart delivered his scripts for The Seeds of Doom very rapidly, and to the approval of Hinchcliffe and Holmes. The Hand of Fear was therefore dropped from the schedule on October 14th, and The Seeds of Doom became the new Serial 4L. A four-part version of The Hand of Fear would eventually be transmitted during Season 14. Unfortunately, not long after The Seeds of Doom was greenlighted, designer Jeremy Bear fell ill after working on the Antarctic camp. Roger Murray Leach was quickly brought onto the production to replace him. As a cost-saving manoeuvre, the costume for the humanoid version of the crinoid was adapted from an Axon outfit, originally created for 1971's The Claws of Axos. Exterior work on the Seeds of Doom began on the grounds of Affelhampton House in Affelhampton, Dorset, from October 30th to November 3rd. This served as Chase's estate. 
Unusually, Canfield elected to record the location scenes using outside broadcast video rather than film to facilitate the special effects needed to realise the growing crinoid. Model filming then took place on November 6 at the Ealing Television Film Studios for footage of the crinoid and of Chase's house. Further model filming involving the Antarctic base occurred at the Puppet Theatre at BBC Television Centre. Studio recording on the Seeds of Doom followed the usual bi-weekly Monday-Tuesday pattern adopted through the 13th production block. The first of these, encompassing November 17th and 18th, were assigned to BBC Television Centre Studio 4 and involved the completion of most of episodes 1 and 2, respectively. Unfortunately, after taping concluded on the Monday, Kenneth Gilbert, playing Dunbar, discovered that he had contracted chickenpox from his daughter and would have to be absent from the set until the last of the three recording sessions. More misfortune occurred the following night when Michael McStay, who played Mobley, was injured in a traffic accident after leaving the studio. Taping would then resume on December 1st and 2nd, again in TC4. The first day saw the recording of the majority of Part 3, as well as Part 4 material in the Special Projects Lab. The next day concentrated on the fourth episode, in addition to scenes in the general lab and the cottage bedroom for Part 5, and in Dunbar's office for each of the final two instalments. Unusually, additional OB recording was then undertaken on December 7th and 8th. The principal venue was the grounds of Buckland Sand, and Cilia Company Limited in Buckland, Surrey, dressed to serve as the Antarctic exteriors. While performing the closing scene outside the TARDIS, the prop, which had been in use since Doctor Who began in 1963, collapsed on Elizabeth Sladen. Also on the 7th, the limousine chauffeur attack on the Doctor and Sarah Jane in Part 3 was taped on a country road near Betchworth in Surrey. The final studio block took place on December 15th and 16th, this time in TC8. Both Gilbert and McStay were able to rejoin the production, with the latter wearing a false beard to hide the scars he had received in the car crash. December 15 was largely devoted to Episode 5, as well as some of Dunbar's scenes from the first four instalments. The 16th began with recording at the main entrance of BBC Television Centre itself, posing as the headquarters of the World Ecology Bureau. Moving back to TC8, Part 6 was completed, as was material in the compound crusher room for part four and episode five scenes in Dunbar's office and the general lab. Work on the Seeds of Doom then wrapped up on December 19th when special effects shots of the giant crinoid were captured in TC4. As the 13th production block concluded, Elizabeth Sladen informed Hinchcliffe of her intent to leave Doctor Who. Having spent three years on the programme, she was finding herself turning down increasingly attractive work, including feature films. However, Sladen did agree to remain for the first two serials of the next season. The broadcast of season 13, meanwhile, concluded on March 6, 1976 with the Seeds of Doom Part 6. Once again, Doctor Who came under fire from Mary Whitehouse of the National Viewers and Listeners Association, who criticised the adventure's violent content and its inclusion of a Molotov cocktail. Seeds of Doom was Robert Banks Stewart's final Doctor Who serial, although he would contribute ideas to The Talons of Wang Chiang, the closing story of season 14, Stewart would continue to work primarily in television as a writer, script editor and producer, helping to develop programmes like Shoestring, Bergerac and The Darling Buds of May. He passed away on January 14, 2016, following a battle with cancer. Serial 4L also marked the end of Douglas Canfield's long-time association with Doctor Who. Canfield did submit a story idea called The Lost Legion to Doctor Who soon after work wrapped on the Seeds of Doom, but this did not make it into production. He continued to direct episodes of shows like The Aneden Line, Shoestring and The Sweeney. Sadly, the heart ailment from which Canfield had long suffered, finally took its toll on the director. He died on January 27, 1984. In Antarctica, British scientists Charles Winlet and Derek Mobley discovered a pod buried in the permafrost and take it back to their camp. John Stevenson, the base's botanist, identifies it as a vegetable-based form and estimated it has been buried in the ice for 20,000 years. In London, Richard Dunbar of the World Ecology Bureau shows the fourth Doctor photographs of the pod at the urging of his superior, Sir Colin Thackeray. The Doctor believes it to be extraterrestrial. He tells Dunbar to tell the expedition not to touch it until he arrives. Back at the base, Stevenson discovers that the pod is growing larger, and he believes it to be absorbing ultraviolet radiation. In England, Dunbar visits the estate of millionaire Harrison Chase, who considers it his mission to protect the plant life of Mother Earth. Dunbar gives Chase the location of the pod, Chase sends his men, Scorby and, and Keeler, to retrieve it. At the base, the pod opens and stings Winlet. When Stevenson and Mobley find him, Winlet's face is covered with green hives. The Doctor and Sarah arrive at the base and find that Winlet's face and body are rapidly becoming covered with green fungus. Outside the base, the Doctor uncovers another pod and notes that they travel in pairs. 
when that blood is found to contain no blood platelets, but instead has schizophytes, microscopic organisms akin to plant bacteria. The doctor tells Sarah that Winlet is turning into a crinoid, a galactic weed that settles on planets and eats the animal life forms. Scorby and Keeler arrive, claiming that their private plane got lost. Mobley is killed by the mutated Winlet. Transforming into a crinoid, Winlet flees the base and shelters in the outside gr generator hut. Scorby and Keeler steal the remaining pod, then escape in their plane. The Doctor and the others are attacked by the crinoid, which kills Stevenson. The Doctor and Sarah flee the base as a bomb set by Scorby and Keeler destroys the area. Doctor and Sarah are picked up by a team from South Bend, while Scorby and Keeler return to Chase in England with the second pod. Dunbar warns Chase that the Doctor and Sarah are still alive and are scheduled to meet with him and Sir Colin. At the meeting, the Doctor and Sarah describe the theft of the pod. He tells Dunbar to arrange for him to go to the Botanic Institute. As they leave, a driver meets them. However, the limousine stops in the countryside and a driver orders them out at gunpoint. The doctor jumps the driver and punches him out. They both escape and search the car and find a painting by Amelia Ducart, a flower artist. When they visit her, Ducart tells them that the owner of the painting is Harrison Chase, who has never paid her for the painting. Chase orders Keeler to inject at the pod with fixed nitrogen. When the Doctor and Sarah try to sneak into the mansion, they are captured and brought before Chase, who decides to show them around the mansion and his plant laboratory before he kills them. When Scorby escorts the Doctor and Sarah into the gardens to kill them, the two overpower him. Sarah escapes, but is captured again. The Doctor rescues her, and in the confusion, a frond from the pod stings Keeler's arm. Keeler soon begins to transform into a crinoid, growing in strength, controlling nearby plants, and even Chase. The crinoid is starting to germinate where it will spread its seeds across the world and create an earth of vegetation. The Seeds of Doom is one of Doctor Who's most accomplished dramas, as well as being one of the more bleak and grotesque stories. Despite its earthbound setting, the horror and gruesome factor is ranked up to 11, with plant life attacking animal life, strangulation by plants and death by compost crushing. This is a story that I could easily watch in one sitting and never become bored by it, despite being six episodes long. The stakes are raised to their highest thanks to an excellent and intense performance from Tom Baker. Like Pyramids of Mars, we have the Doctor at his most brooding and alien because of the danger of the situation. The Doctor is not wasting any time here or kidding around and is rude to everyone he meets. Uh, are you okay dressed like that? You, you don't seem to notice the cold. I haven't come 10,000 miles to discuss the weather, Mr. Mobley. Can I see the sick man? If we don't find that pod before it germinates, it'll be the end of everything. Everything, you understand? Even your pension! In fact, let's break down this scene. On paper, this is the Doctor and Sarah angry that no one will believe them of the attack on the Antarctic base, but the staging of this is fantastic. The way he carries the chair on his head, stumbling over his words and not even bothering to sit on the chair, it just makes the scene all the more interesting thanks to Tom's performance. Because the Doctor is taking the threat so seriously, the audience is totally on his side and the behaviour is completely justified. You don't deny for a second that he is the hero, and Tom absolutely nails this aspect of the character. The Doctor also adopts a surprisingly violent streak in this serial. He punches the chauffeur, which supposedly takes the man to hospital, twists Scorby's neck, jumps through a skylight to save Sarah, whilst thrashing a chair over Scorby, and even brandishes a pistol at one point. Again, all these actions I think are completely justifiable, because we are in a situation where reasoning with greedy humans, and an alien that is only doing what its biology intended, won't cut it. However, that's not to say we don't see the Doctor's compassionate side. His anger at Scorby taking Sarah as a hostage is fantastic. You can tell how much the Doctor cares for Sarah. And there's this line as well. How do you do? Have you met Miss Smith? She's my best friend. It's such a small moment, but I absolutely love it. In just one line, they sum up how much the Doctor and Sarah mean to each other. But then in just a few seconds, the Doctor switches to being completely serious, demanding that Chase hands over the pod. It works so well thanks to Tom's performance and doesn't come across as a huge tonal shift. The narration that plays over scenes of the crinoid hunting in the Antarctic snow is superb. Tom's voice really sells how dangerous this creature is, and is perfect foreshadowing for how even more powerful the crinoid will become later on in the story. The Doctor is completely angry at humanity's greed and stupidity, evident by his conversation with Scorby in Part 5. The Doctor often finds these traits of humans tiresome at best, but because the stakes are so high, it racks the tension up to infinity. I love his disinterest in Scorby's rant about being a survivor. Yeah, he may have lived and seen a lot, but that's nothing compared to the giant crinoid attacking the house. I even love his comedic moments, like the 360 degree turn when Scorby tells him to turn around. Tom Baker is on absolutely top form here, and throughout the season, the writers have made a conscious effort to make the Doctor more alien than ever before. I really think this has helped by how alien the villains have been this season. 
The majority of them are survivors like the Zygons and Morbius, or the fear of the unknown like the Antimatter or Sutek. Throughout season 13, the stakes were raised even higher than ever before, and Tom's charm and investment just makes the stories even more exceptional than the standard. Elizabeth Sladen is once again superb and has fantastic chemistry with Tom Baker. If you want a story that showcases everything what makes her fantastic, I point to this one. She's resourceful, witty, brave, and even saves the Doctor at one point. Just from seeing their on-screen actions together, you completely buy that these two are best friends. Even when she nearly dies in the base's explosion, she's more concerned with if the Doctor is safe than her own livelihood. The cliffhanger to episode 3 is really tense. Sarah is about to be tested by the crinoid pod, and we already know what its effects are thanks to Winlet being infected by it, and we don't want the same thing to happen to Sarah. I like how her investigative journalism comes back as she's familiar with the flower painter Amelia Ducar, which inevitably leads them to Chase's mansion. Even when she's being hunted down by the guards, she still does her best to get help by warning Ducar that the Doctor and Sarah are trapped in Chase's mansion. I like how she's not beyond stupidity and presses the wrong button when the Doctor is in the compost machine. <laughs> Sarah even tells Scorby off, claiming the Doctor is the better person because he's a man who has principles. Scorby doesn't even answer, but you know she's won the conversation. Later, Scorby compares the guards who desert the mansion to a bunch of women, yet Sarah is the one to go outside and see what the crinoid is doing. At a scream, obviously someone is in trouble. Well, what can we do with that thing roaming about out there? What was that you just said about women? Ugh, oh, I love it. Her scene with Chase at the end is really brave. She tries to humour him despite being clearly insane and having no remorse for his action. She still stands courageous in the face of danger. Her chemistry with the Doctor just grew further in strength during this season, and it's completely adorable that they end the season laughing together. It's only a shame that they have two stories left after all this. The supporting cast in The Seeds of Doom is one of the very best that the series has ever had. They all feel well defined and developed people. Tony Beckley plays Harrison Chase, a multi-millionaire botanist who plans to use the crinoid for his own purposes. Beckley is superb as Chase and gives one of the most chilling performances in the series' history. For the most part, Chase rarely raises his voice but usually has inhuman solutions to his problems. When told that the first pod was destroyed in Antarctica along with the crew, he's more disappointed that he couldn't have two pods rather than people dying. He views all humans as completely dispensable, as the crinoid is a unique creature. Even when Keeler is infected by it, he's simply fascinated by his transformation rather than scared. The way he plans to crush the Doctor into compost is also fantastic. Even in Murder, he's trying to help the plants win. Chase's very nature is even more revolting than the crinoid, as the plant is only doing what nature set out for it to do. However, I do like his scene with Amelia Ducar. You can see him trying to repress a lot of anger and doesn't have much patience with her, but gives her the money she wants so as not to arouse suspicion from anybody. When he becomes possessed by the crinoid in part 5, Chase loses a lot of his emotional stability and becomes even more dangerous. The way he sits calmly surrounded by the plants, promising them a new era, may sound silly on paper, but Beckley completely sells it. I even like his comedic moment with his butler Hargreaves. It's Mr. Keeler. Something's happening to that pod. Why are you shouting, Hargreaves? His demise is completely fitting for his character. Chase is killed and crushed by the compost machine, and is made part of the garden. He becomes one with nature. The irony is so delicious. John Chalice plays Scorby, Chase's henchman. Now, I'm sure a lot of people will recognise John as Boise from Only Fools and Horses, but seeing him in both these productions, despite being two worlds away, shows how versatile an actor he really is. Scorby is a violent bully and is similar to Chase in how he doesn't care who gets killed or hurt in the crossfire, as long as he gets what he wants. Scorby doesn't feel in power unless he has a weapon in his hands, making him a dangerous and unpredictable thug. However, his character development in the final two episodes feels genuine. He helps the Doctor and Sarah to try and defeat the crinoid, but he doesn't reform or instantly become a better person. He's still the same character who cares for no one but himself, but now he's the one who isn't in power and is being viewed as disposable by Chase. Like the crinoid, his ultimate goal is to survive, and he doesn't care who gets hurt, even the Doctor tells him that bullets and bombs aren't the answer to everything. By the end, his survivor's instinct takes over and he's killed by not listening to the Doctor and drowns in a pond by the crinoid. Like Chase, his demise feels very fitting. Mark Jones plays reluctant scientist Keeler, who eventually becomes infected by the crinoid. 
Keeler is the complete opposite to Scorby and a total pacifist. One thing I like that shows the difference between the two men is their body language. In the base, Scorby holds the gun casually, which tells you how used to using guns he is. Compare that to Keeler when he guards the Doctor and Sarah and he has the gun raised with his arm fully straight. You can tell he doesn't want to use it, but he's maintaining the illusion that he will use it if necessary. It's ironic how the most pacifist character becomes the most destructive plant in the universe. His crinoid transformation is absolutely horrific. He seethes with anger to Sarah that it, that it might have been her instead, and rages at Sarah for refusing to help him. The physical and psychological effects the crinoid has on Keeler is brutal, and is so horrific to watch. Sylvia Coleridge plays painter Amelia Ducar. She's a delightfully scatty character that provides much needed levity to this otherwise dark story. Harrison chased them in the fair. Good lord, he never paid me. It's terrific stuff. Kenneth Gilbert plays Dunbar, who initially informs Chase about the pod, but slowly but surely realises that everything is going too far, and is eventually killed by the crinoid. Despite seeing the error of his ways, he's still punished for his actions. It's a really cynical view, but even in Doctor Who, all of our actions have consequences. Seymour Green plays Chase's butler Hargreaves. This is a character that could have been cut entirely, but Green really brings this character to life. He seems to be the only straight man in Chase's mansion amidst all the madness. I love his go-with-the-flow attitude to everything that occurs. He's completely fine with Chase taking photos of the crinoid and experimenting on Keeler, but when Scorby orders him to seal the doors and windows, he just goes with it. Well, listen, I'll post a lookout where so they're not going to stay very long. Get over to the workshop, get some timber. We've got to board up all these ground floor windows. Oh, if you say so. That line delivery is the icing on the cake. Hubert Rees plays John Stevenson, the lead bo botanist at the Antarctic base. He's the one who places an ultraviolet lamp on the first pod, which eventually awakens the crinoid. Despite his best efforts to help the Doctor, he's still killed by it, even though he was the one who unwittingly brought it back to life. Michael McStay plays zoologist Derek Moberly and plans to amputate Winlet's arm to stop the infection. I like how despite not having much experience, the Doctor says you must help yourselves, and agrees to do it, but he is still killed by the crinoid. Despite only appearing in two episodes, the Antarctic crew feel like real people that have their arcs resolved in two episodes, brought to life by great performances. Sadly, the weak link for me is the inclusion of Unit. The beloved family feel of the Pertwee era is now long gone at this point, and they've just been relegated to generic army men. This would be the final appearance of Unit until Battlefield in Season 26. Then again, this doesn't feel like they were trying to give Unit a massive send-off, but more or less a means to an end. The production values are fantastic in this story, thanks to cinematic direction from Douglas Canfield. The snowy landscapes of Antarctica look fantastic. You almost feel that the production team really flew out to the South Pole. The mix of live-action snow and visual effects really helps to sell the location. The grounds covering Chase's country mansion are also brilliant. It gives Chase's house such an atmospheric feel. The autumn location work gives the chase scenes a very sumptuous feel, and is a story definitely to watch at Halloween time. The crinoid effects itself have held up for the most part. When it's in its humanoid form, it looks great. The way the human face becomes embedded in the plant form is horrific, and it looks like it could kill a human with its bare hands, or vines. Sadly, when the crinoid does become larger, I think this is where it shows its age, as it tends to shuffle about rather slowly. Luckily, it isn't on screen for too long. However, I think the stop motion effects of when it attacks the house in part 6 is pretty effective, and I wonder if for the eventual season 13 Blu-ray release, the visual effects would get a CGI update. What works so well about the crinoid is how it starts off as a small seed, and ends up growing and growing until it becomes a very big problem. It not only grows in size, but is able to control surrounding plants, and will soon infect the entire planet when it sends out seed pods in its germination phase. The crinoid is one of the most terrifying enemies the Doctor has ever faced, and is just superb to watch. It's one of the best one-off villains the series has ever had. Jeffrey Burgeon returns to provide a spine-tingling score to the story, and like Terror of the Zygons, is absolutely brilliant. One of my favourite tracks is when Dunbar is killed by the crinoid. I love the use of drums whilst Dunbar is looking for it, but the music changes when he eventually sees it, indicating that the hunter has become the hunted. The music used when Sarah enters the cottage is straight out of a horror film. The use of strings and the flute just brings the atmosphere to life. I love how the music gets louder and louder towards the end of episode 2, as the clock ticks down and comes to a stop when the bass explodes. It sounds utterly gorgeous and racks the tension up for the scene. I find it criminal that Jeffrey didn't do any more stories after this one, as the man had exceptional music talent. 
If you want to listen to his music individually, you can find it on the DVD release as an isolated score. Alternatively, you can find it in a rare CD with Terror the Zygons, but only buy if you're willing to put down the cash for it. Or you can find certain tracks of the score on the 50th anniversary CD collection. Seeds of Doom is more or less a flawless Doctor Who adventure, packed with an excellent script, scary moments, sublime performances from the cast, and superb direction that lifts the production to stand head over heels of other stories of its time. The Doctor and Sarah Jane are on top form and dazzle their way through the adventure. The music is utterly gorgeous, and despite being six episodes, it's a story you could easily watch in one go and never feel bored by it. The monster and villain are one of the best that the series has ever had, and it's an absolute blast to watch from start to finish. The Seeds of Doom is held in high regard by many fans, and after watching it again, I can definitely see why. It deserves all the praise in the world, and I simply adore it. Thank <laughs> you.